Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation to give this talk on the use of machine learning in clinical practice and what we can do with it and what are the current problems. When we look at clinical practice, what we need to do is we need to make a kind of decision on individual patients where we try to make a diagnosis of these patients and linked to this diagnosis, try to do a prognosis and also try to do kind of a choice of the, of the right therapy for these patients. While it's relatively easy to look at the normal patients, uh, which are having not too many problems, or where it's also easy to find the extreme, the real sick patients that have, in this case, in, in hypertrophics or kind of thickened hearts, have a high risk of arrhythmias or heart failure, it's much more difficult to look at the ones in between, and which is like what we call this clinical gray zone, where we can have some information on the patient, but where we need to decide where in the spectrum the patient is. So in a lot of the machine learning, for example, that is being used or engineering research, what we often do is we look at extremes, at very sick versus very normal patients or one diagnosis versus the other. But in reality, there's like a continuous spectrum and where we need to try to look at all the information that we have available. In this case, it's echocardiography together with Doppler or for blood flow and deformation imaging in, in cardiac patients. And based on this information, we have to see see where in the whole spectrum of normal to disease this patient is located. Now, of course, when we make clinical decisions, it's not only based on one type of images. So we cannot use one type of information. So what we need to do in clinical practice is really integrate information, and that information can be just the anamnesis and talking to the patient. We need to integrate lab information in cardiology, ECGs, different type of images. And it's only with the integration of all this information that we can make proper decisions in real clinical practice. Now, when we want to see where machine learning can help in order to uh, support clinical practice, what we need to do is also we need to know where problems are currently occurring and then see whether we can, might be able to help. And when you look at the problems with diagnostic imaging, where clinicians are making mistakes, what we then see is that a large part of the mistakes is related to underinterpretation of a finding. So that means that you look at a patient, you, you find something, you see something, and then immediately you come to the conclusion for that patient without looking at everything else. So very often there might be comorbidities, for example, that you miss if you don't properly examine the patient further. There can be some technical problems also, of course, and these technical problems can partially also solve. But the main thing is that we have to try to complete all the information without assumptions. And for that also, I think it's interesting to know how we are actually making decisions. Humans are extremely good in pattern recognition. So that means that if we get information, we immediately recognize what this, this information uh, kind of represents, and we try to take actions for this. Now, this has potential problems in medicine. Eh? And so here is an example of a study where they took computer tomography images from the lungs and they asked radiologists in order to look at them for lung cancer, so especially for lung nodules. But also what they, what they did is they kind of embedded this gorilla digitally in these images. And when they asked the radiologist to look at it, 80% of the radiologists did not see that this gorilla was embedded in these images. So this is, of course, because they've never been trained in order to recognize gorillas, and they only have been trained to recognize lung cancer. And if they don't take care, then, of course, you don't see what you don't, what you're not trained for. So this is our inherent kind of uh, um, pattern recognition ability that humans are quite good at. Another study that shows something similar, but also shows how we can kind of do this better, is here is x-rays of the chest where they removed the clavicular. So one of the bones was removed digitally from these images. Then again, they asked the radiologist in order to look, at, look for lung cancer in these patients. Then again, the majority of the people did not recognize or did not notice that this bone was missing. However, when we ask them to say like, look, these are patients undergoing some kind of uh, experimental therapy that might affect the lungs in some ways, can you please see whether you find something? What you then see is that almost everybody recognized that this was the case. 
So that means that they start looking at these images in a different way. And that is what we call our kind of type two kind yeah. of uh, processing, where instead of just doing pen recognition and make a quick decision based on that, what we do is we really do reasoning on these images and we're really going to try to see, okay, is this normal? Is that normal? Do I see something strange or not? And it is this type two uh, kind of uh, decision-making, which is very often very important in medicine. Now, when we use machine learning, there are, of course, a lot of different algorithms that we can use. We're not going to go in detail here. And of course, the most known or the most popular currently is deep learning, where convolutional neural networks are being used in order to recognize pattern, recognize images, recognize text or something like that. But besides that, we have many, many other of, of the uh, algorithms. Eh? And when we look, for example, at, at, at uh, deep learning, deep learning is extremely powerful in order to recognize patterns and especially recognize images. And here you see some examples that you know from Google or Facebook or something like that, where you provide an image and the computer tells you what would be in this image. And even difficult things like, for example, these uh, chihuahuas and muffins, mostly the computer kind of perfectly uh, is able to discriminate these, although sometimes you see that it actually makes mistakes. And this is a little bit a problem, right? because these mistakes, when it's in Google and, and a different label, you don't care so much. But if it's, of course, a decision on a patient that then has implications, for example, on therapy, then it becomes, of course, a little bit more important. Right? So even small errors can make a big difference. Similarly, also, if we use these techniques to um, investigate some medical problems, what we also very see is that, uh, very often see is that it recognizes patterns and associations. And here is an example of this. So where Twitter was analyzed in order to try to predict kind of uh, cardiovascular diseases and actually deaths from, from kind of cardiovascular diseases. And as you can see from this, Twitter is actually quite good in order to predict this. In a way, this is logical, right? because of course, the people that are tweeting, that are visiting the cardiologist and have smoked uh, a lot of cigarettes and have eaten a lot of hamburgers today, they of course have much higher chance for cardiovascular death than others. And so this is an association and of course cannot be made directly for medical decision making. Right? So we really have to take care of what is going on. And that's why it's also very important that we need to make this very interpretable and we need to include domain knowledge. So we need to know clinical or physiological knowledge in order to use this type of techniques. And also just also another example to, to show that you can only recognize what you're trained for if you use this kind of type one techniques. Here you see an example of a uh, neural network that was trained in order to recognize COVID on uh, chest X-rays. And of course, if you then give a totally unrelated image, it can still say with very high confidence that it's COVID because it was never used in training and it looks like something kind of dark and some white kind of dots on a kind of darker background. background. So it's really important to know how it's being trained, what it can do, and how we have to interpret it. And also keep in mind, it's like these neural networks, what they do is they actually do this type one pattern recognition. And actually uh, other researchers here, as an example, they have trained a bunch of pigeons in order to recognize um, abnormalities in, in histology images. And what they actually has, have proven is that the pigeons are better even than the neural networks by Google, for example. And the reason for this is, of course, that the pigeon brain is kind of already a much more complicated neural network than we can currently do with computers. But it just shows you that what you're doing, actually, if you use this type of techniques in order to recognize patterns or make kind of decisions, this is actually that similar to if you would train pigeons in order to do this. So that's important to keep in mind. So that's why I think it's really important that we go back to how clinical decision making is happening, because that is what we need to do. We need to support clinical decision making. And so when we look at how this happens in practice, is a patient comes to the physician, then data is being acquired. There can be imaging data, other data, lab data, for example. From this data, features are extracted through measurements. And this limited set of features, which is already an enormous data reduction from the original data, is then being used in order to generate a state of the patient in the mind of the clinician. And this state is next being compared to populations that either the clinician knows from training or 
patients that they have seen before or that they know from guidelines, for example. And it's through this comparison with populations that then a decision can be made, trying kind of inferring that depending on which population the patient is belonging to, then we can infer whether we need to do certain interventions, whether we need more data to make decisions or whether the patient can go home. So when we look at these things is for each of these parts, we can actually try to use uh, machine learning in order to improve. And the first thing is with the image acquisition or the data acquisition, especially the feature extraction, what have been shown is that when we use deep learning here, for example, we can really automate measurements and we can make life much easier uh, for the clinician. And actually we can make it even more reproducible. So this is actually currently available and is already being used. Now, if we would go one step further and try to use this kind of techniques in order to really make some kind of diagnostic decisions, we have to start to be careful. Huh? So here is an example of where the uh, a network was trained in order to recognize these hypertrophic hearts, so hearts with thick walls. And as you can see, the network is very much able to recognize the hearts with the thick walls. But when we look at what they recognize as normal, what we see here is this kind of heart. You see that this is much more global and much bigger. So this is, of course, not a hypertrophic heart, but this is a dilated heart, but it's certainly not normal. So that means, again, that we have to make sure that we use the right training set in order to make decisions and not make inferences, which are then later problematic. So that's why I think we have to go as close as possible to how clinicians are working. Yeah? And so what we could do there is like, if we have a training data set, what we can do is we can take the data from all these patients where we have extracted features. And what we now do is based on feature similarity, what we would try to do is try to position these patients with regards to each other so that patients with similar features, and that can be complex features based on imaging, lab, ECG, or even age and this kind of things. What we do is based on the similarity, we place them closer or further away from each other. And then what we can do is we can then uh, assume that patients which are close to each other, so which belong to a certain pheno group, and so which have the same phenotype, so the same measurements, that they are similar to, to uh, each other, and we can identify different pheno groups depending on the positioning. What we then can do is if we have a training data set with outcomes, for example, we can do risk assessment based on this. So saying that in this group, the risk would be much higher compared to others. So this is type of clustering algorithms that you could use in order to do that. And then also what you can do is if you have treatment information, you can associate this treatment information with that. Once we have trained this, what we now can do is we can take a new patient, we can position this patient in that space. And what we then can do is we can infer that the patient would belong to, to this pheno group of which we know the risk and of which we know ideal treatments. And so that means that we can make predictions based on this for the individual patients. And even what we can do is because this is data that can change over time. Eh? So depending on how the, the patient is being followed up and the data that's available, what we can actually see is that we can try to quantify paths that are uh, patients following in this data space. And based on this, we can see whether a patient is on the way to improvement, for example, or is deteriorating. So we can really try to use this type of technique. So where we really collect the data of the patient, we integrate that data, very heterogeneous data. We use this to position a patient with regard to others. We infer a diagnosis based on that. We can infer a risk based on, on this positioning and then try to go to personal treatment. And with each of these type of uh, parts that needs to be done in this pathway, we can try to use artificial intelligence to do it. And here is an example of a study that is analyzed based on this. So here we see the same four patients that I showed you before. And you can really see now that these patients, depending on their risk and their normality, are positioned at different places. So here, the data from imaging and the data of deformation, together with potential genotypes, for example, in this case, is being used for this. And so depending on this positioning, now we can have an objective way to kind of really look at this whole spectrum of diseases. And you see there's no black and white. You see towards this, you get the abnormal ones with abnormal genes and very high risk. And towards this part, we really have the normal ones. And so we can then also link this. Eh? As I said before, you can identify clusters and you can really kind of see what is the reason for patients to be there and how we then have to treat, treat them. 
So when we look at this whole way of clinical decision making and we try to see how we can machine learning for this, we see that in all these different places we can. Eh? So based on risk assessment, for example, data collection, data acquisition, feature extraction, comparing to data where we can use local data, we can in identify different types of decisions, we can make this uh, um, kind of locally dependent, for example. And one of the things is also that here outcome can be a continuous spectrum eh? because in many kind of decision making, especially when we use neural networks, we have to say like kind of good or bad outcome. It's mostly like a black and white decision that we have to make. But of course, this way you can make kind of continuous decisions and you can put like you can really quantify risks, for example, and you can use this for decisions. So I think with currently in with the use of machine learning for clinical decisions, we have a lot of potentials there and that goes from data acquisition and feature extraction, which are already there and many companies are already including in their equipment. And we can start to use this for integrating information in a clever way and we can try to use this for interpreting patients and especially in a continuous way, and especially using or very much close to the way that clinicians are reasoning, and thus make it much more acceptable and interpretable for the clinicians. Thank you very much.